Aloha, everyone, and welcome back to Stay in Yana Hat. Uh, my name is Maria Mera. I'm your host, and I'm also a financial advisor with Edward Jones. I'm super happy today because I'm bringing um, an awesome documentary filmmaker and uh, also an awesome friend and a fellow Spaniard, Gemma Cubero del Barrio. Gemma, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to see you, Maria. <laughs> okay, well, I, uh, I, we interviewed you uh, five years ago, so five years back, and, uh, <laughs> and we've changed, we've both changed a little bit, but um, please let Quite us a know, <laughs> yeah, well, that's, a, that's a little, <laughs> tell us what is a documentary filmmaker for those of us who are not so familiar with it. So a documentary filmmaker is um, a person that is a storyteller, uh, I would say a storyteller in the 21st century um, um, because his documentary means that uh, we tell stories that are based in reality um, hopefully stories that have not been told before so we give opportunities to bring new new voices um, into the world but certainly about realities that are already here but may not be seen and we use the language of cinema so the beauty of documentary film is that you're you are showing reality, but using sound and the visual language of cinema and music. And it's a very collaborative uh, medium. It's not like a painter that paints by, its, by herself. It's really, you really need an amazing team to make it happen and amazing stories from real people. So um, do you write the, do you write the movies? Do you get a script before? Um... An idea yeah. before? So I'm going to tell you my process, which is certainly might differ from other filmmakers. So uh, an idea emerged. For me, I consider that each film is a universe. So I don't work with a script. What I do is I come from journalism. So I use all the codes of uh, ethic, ethical codes of journalism. I find a story that is going to interest me for long enough to be able to sustain it, to see how it develops. So I contact the characters. I gain access, that is, access is everything in documentary film. And then I spend whatever time it takes, whatever time it takes for me to really enter that universe and to be able to capture the essence of the person uh, that I am or the subject matter that I am I'm treating. So I don't, uh, the script is, uh, is an organic process that you create as, as you go. So you might have an idea, but you always have to be very flexible to adjust, to get to know the person. Uh, the idea changes, uh, the filmmaker changes in the process, the character's life change in the process. So changes are really an, a very um, present, organic yeah, ingredient in documentary mm -hmm. film. So, but you must have uh, some sort of like timeline, right? Or, or do, mm. you, do you know how long it's gonna take you to, to get at least the, the filming of the movie? So I really never know. Of course, I've made films um, in two years, uh, which that is a quick timeline for me. But um, I really never know how long it's going to take. I'm an independent filmmaker, so I have a lot of freedom in terms of how I raise the money. Sometimes the raising of the money takes a lot of time. Uh, sometimes, depending on the story that you are dealing with, the story does not develop. So you need to be bearing witness to the person's life. And uh, there are many factors why you, it might take you years to, to do a film. Um, and I normally let that process uh, just uh, speak to me. And um, But then I want to say that the script is actually made once you have gathered all the ingredients, all the interviews, and then you work with an editor. I work with an editor. Uh, to craft uh, the script based on the footage that you have already shot and the interviews that you have. And then the timeline will be determined based on the funding and the story that you're telling. So do you, for what I hear, and again, for my finance background, do you do your own funding? Um, I actually raise the money. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, do you, you're I'm not independently in wealthy. <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I meant, no, no, no. I meant you, you are the one searching for that, uh, for those funds. Yeah. In my case, yes, I produce and direct. And, um, I was very fortunate before I got into film to work in the nonprofit sector and learn the craft of fundraising. 
I remember talking to my family in Spain. They were like, fundraising, what is that? You're begging for money. But then it really helped me to be able to figure out how to get the financing through foundations, individual donors. PBS has been very generous with me. Um, so you get the, fun I, I raise the money uh, for the films, yeah. Let's let's uh, get it, let's get it started because I'm sure our audience is already looking forward to hear about your film. So let's let's start with the very first one. Uh, ella es el matador. She's the matador. Tell us a little bit about that first project. So uh, ella es el matador is a story about two women that um, um, are really rare in the sense that they um, are they're actually. Um, in the profession of bullfighting, not as viewers or as spectators, but actually as matadors. <laughs> so the film follows the two women, um, passion into um, this profession. And uh, we work, I made this film with Celeste Carrasco. Um, this was our first film. Uh, it was primarily shot in Spain, but also we spent time in Latin America. And the film um, did really well, premiered on POV, in point of view, it shot over the years, it continues to show. And uh, you know, every film you make is about, you come up with an idea. So this was definitely a film about women, why the women cannot bullfight. And then in the process of making the film, we really discovered that bullfighting has really no gender in the sense of what, what it takes to be in front of the animal. So it's a really beautiful film. I'm very proud of it. Um, we had a recent screening at the, with the Spanish embassy in LA and Maripal was able to join from, from Mexico and, you know, uh, she's still yes. fighting. So, I'm yeah. sure. so how, how was the welcome in, in Spain um, of the movie? Was it, be, because bullfighting in Spain is becoming more and more controversial. So was it well accepted? So it was difficult. Uh, it was difficult um, because uh, in different ways. In the making of, during the making of the film, a lot of people were not supportive of the women bullfighting because they are rare and uh, unknown. And uh, they were also. It was also difficult because um, some women don't necessarily want the, these women to be, you know, um, doing bullfighting. So we faced a lot of obstacles. But I have to say that. The film has done uh, very well, like it showed nationally on PBS. It was one of the most uh, watched uh, films in, um, in the US. It really never showed in Spain. I remember the reason why, and it's because um, they really didn't want to bring up the issue of bullfighting on, on Spanish television. So I thought that was mm -hmm. really ironic that the film really got a lot of recognition <laughs> outside of Spain, but it still has not shown on Spanish television because it's a very political subject matter. But I have to say that it's been really beautiful how um, it has been embraced even by the, for instance, the bullfighting community that I thought there would be like really, um, you know, maybe uh, uh, nervous about showing the experiences of women. I know they really actually, one of the biggest compliments we got is that the men also really connected to the story that we were saying. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the film got a, um, did a screening festivals in Spain and we got a couple of uh, awards. But it has never shown on Spanish television. Is maybe one day it will happen. I feel like the film is really timeless. Uh, so I'm not sure that maybe one yeah. day it will show. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And it was uh, it was my first movie, um, seeing that first movie from you. And uh, I was very impressed. Um, so, OK, so we go from Spain um, mm -hmm. to Hawaii, also very character based, but a completely different uh, documentary from is the matador to automatic cake. Um, yes. So tell us about this, this movie film in Hawaii. So um, I fell in love with Hawaii and I moved here um, years ago. And uh, through a friend of a friend, I got to know Otto from Auto Cake. You might know him. He's based in Kaimuki. Yes. And he's this amazing artist whose expression is really to create these amazing cheesecakes and um, he's endless um, he's a, um, a very creative person and at the time that I met him he was really dealing with a lot of um, crime and a lot of um, what at that time I consider police corruption like the the shop was really attacked by uh, by drug dealers and so on and nobody was doing anything about it so he gave me a call and asked me if I could come and help him and I followed him for five years and we premiered at the Hawaii International Film Festival in 2017 
And um, it was really beautiful. I did this film without raising any money. I wanted to really do it in a different way, shoot it myself, because I thought it would be extremely difficult to actually raise funds for a character like Otto, even though he is super popular. And it was really, I learned a lot about just um, doing uh, a film with um, your own resources, very de doing it yourself. And um, yeah, so that is automatic cake. Every film I make is completely different. That's one of my challenges. Totally different, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that one, and we've been seeing while you were talking, we've been seeing uh, some pictures of the premiere, and uh, so those are those are pictures of um, of the screenings and the premieres. Um, and this was when when Otto had the store downtown, not in Kaimuki, yes. right? It, it was more I like the know. downtown. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, so we keep we keep moving to um, <laughs> now. Which one should we go first? Because the next one is based on the in the same place, also very character based, very strong women uh, as characters. Um, yeah. So let's let's do our actual speech. Whichever you want. Let's, or let's the see island in, the island in well, me first. Yeah. Or okay, let's do the island in me. So tell tell us about this project. It's not. Uh, is it already done? So it's almost done. And um, so when I moved to Hawaii, um, I've been living in Hawaii for over a decade. But um, in 2012, I moved back here. And that's when I started with Automatic Cake. And also, but I moved back to Hawaii because I was following the life of Amelia Borowski and Johnny Frisbee, two really remarkable women that have grown in a, an atoll in the Pacific, in the Cook Islands, uh, called Puka Puka. So the film has been named Homecoming for many years, but now I just changed the film to the island in me. And now we are submitting to festivals and very soon we will be able to celebrate a premiere, which I'm really excited about, but I can't really reveal yet. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, I work on that film for nine years and it's almost done. My, all my team is uh, finishing the color and sound and the music is done. Um, so I'm really excited that that's coming up next. And so uh, you, I'm going to interrupt you, Hema, because you picked my curiosity. Why did you change from Homecoming to The Island in Me? You know, uh, it's very common with a documentary film. You start with a title because you have to create a proposal. We did a crowdfunding campaign. And at that time, um, I knew the film was essentially about the return of these two women back to their childhood home. So it was a homecoming, right? At that time, mm -hmm. and it was named for many years homecoming. Everybody knows it as homecoming. And, um, and then uh, very recently, actually, uh, when I was, the film was almost done, right? So the film was crafted. The script had been written in the sense of this. The film was edited. I picture lock it. And um, nine years have passed. And now um, if you go into Netflix and you type, type homecoming, it was like, I couldn't believe it. It was the same, like Homecoming, a film about Beyonce, Homecoming, the series, oh. Homecoming. So I knew that that mm -hmm. title would not work. Um, and it was challenging to change it because people have known it as Homecoming. But I also realized that The Island in Me is a much better title because in the process of making the film, you go through the experience of it. And uh, for me, this film that is coming up is very much about, uh, it's very personal. And it's also about, I want the audience when you watch it, that you feel like the island is in you when you leave the movie. Okay. So the island in me is really, it's really for all of us. It's to, yeah. to feel it that way. Um, so and for the women, for, and for, for, and for, every, for the women in the film, especially, but mm -hmm. also I, I hope that it will also, you will also take a little bit of the island with you. Okay, so tell us a little bit about this island. How how many people live there? So Puka Puka is a coral atoll located in the northern group of the Cook Islands. Um, I think right now about 400, 450 people live in Puka Puka. Uh, most of Puka Pukans live in, uh, they migrate to the, uh, they live in the diaspora and um, in actually in New Zealand and Australia, most of them. And it's a place that is uh, has never been documented in film before. Uh, it's uh, an atoll that has its own language, like the Basques, for instance, in Spain. It's like, even mm -hmm. though they're part of the Cook Islands, they, their, their language is ancient, more than 2000 years old. And they keep their own cultural practices, their own traditions. Um, and so 
the, do, the, they, do they also speak English mostly or? They or, speak a little so bit they, of English. There is a school where they learn English. Most people speak a little bit of English, but their root language is really Puka Puka. Okay. And it's very interesting now that I'm taking it to festivals, I can never find Puka Puka in the choice of language. So people are actually adding the Puka Puka language too. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love that. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a really a remarkable place that has a lot to offer. And the story of the island in me tells, you know, is the journey of these women, how the, the atoll marked the life of these women. And, and also you will see that um, I ended up putting myself in the film because the, the island also really uh, created a deep in, impact on me. So, um, you know, um, so uh, ge geographically speaking, I, I'm just thinking about the logistics of filming this. You have to fly to the Cook Islands and then from the Cook Islands, uh, pick a board. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I, I encourage here. everybody to Google Puka Puka and see how if they can get there. There's actually <laughs> it's very difficult to get there. There's not like charter, you have to charter a plane. There are two ways to get there. Go to Rarotonga and um, and wait for a boat. Whenever the boat leaves, you really never know when. There's no passenger boats. There's like cargo, only cargo boats that go by. Now with COVID, I think everything has been shut down. So there's really not even transportation, but there's not a scheduled transportation. Um, and uh, you need to bring most of the, you know, everything that you need in. And then you could also charter a plane, but it's, it's very, very expensive to charter a plane to get there. So Okay, so... No, no hotels or no place no. to stay other than uh, with the locals. No, it's also a, a culture uh, that is outside of the capitalist system in the sense that um, they do m deal with money and they're very intelligent with it and super sophisticated culture. But it's really a place that is outside of the, the capitalist system. They have it's a communal society. OK, so do they depend on the uh, New Zealand government or? So uh, the the island is self sufficient in the in terms of food and uh, they are able to live out of the food and the fish that they there that is in so the ocean. self sufficient yeah yeah they're self sufficient uh, of course the car the boats um, are changing the island too like they they do bring like other goods you know like meat and you know just other things that like right now they have solar power that New Zealand actually help uh, install in the island. And um, they are, have a very strong connection, of course, to Rarotonga and the Cook Islands, but also the influence of New Zealand is very strong in the sense that they do get, um, they have a, a New Zealand passport and they're, you know, there's a bank in Puka Puka. So a lot of the transactions actually happen with New Zealand. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would like uh, our audience to have, because we are talking about it, but it's nothing like, it's nothing like a thousand words plus a video right so let's let's see the video of uh, our atoll speaks and then we will talk about the uh, the, the, the other movie We are the children of the Ulu of the Watu of Puka Puka. How long can we call Puka Puka the island home? Climate change is the biggest threat to our existence. Our atoll speak.
Well, I wanted people to see it because I think that just the image, it, um, it means so much, right? What a beautiful place. And uh, tell us about the voice that who, who, who talks there. So the beauty for me of this film, this film, I never thought I was going to make it, but we were making the island in me. And then I needed to go back to Puka Puka. So we got funding from the United Nations to be able to return. And they asked me to do something about climate change, but they said, you know, four or five minutes, uh, something on climate change. They gave me complete freedom. So I have done so many interviews. I went back to Puka Puka and lived there for five months. And they gave me, I had so much information when I returned that I, we decided that we will be making this film by selecting the lines from the interviews. We will do the script, the narration that you hear by selecting the lines from the people that talk to me about climate change and conservation practices. And with Amelia Borowski and Johnny Frisbee, the main characters of the other film, we actually created the narrative. And then it occurred to me, um, Johnny Frisbee, um, she's a Cook Island legend. She's the only Puka Puka woman living also near, near me in Hawaii, you know, and she's an amazing writer. So we decided that she would be the voice for the film and, and it will be the voice of the people of Puka Puka. So that is her beautiful voice. Beautiful, beautiful voice. Yeah, it's uh, so um, spiritual, right? That it, it almost like you, you feel it more, uh, or at least it, it had that effect on me. Um, okay, so this is Spaniard who went from uh, Spain to LA, to Hawaii, to Puka Puka. <laughs> and, uh, and thanks to you, we all know where Puka Puka is, <laughs> at least in Hawaii. Um, where is your heart, Gemma? Where is my heart? Yep. Geographically, is, geographically speaking, because you've been to so many places and had so many experiences. Um, where, where is the place where you, where you want uh, to be? You know, I have a very deep connection with Hawaii. Um, I actually feel that this is a big place for me. Um, my heart is wherever I go, but certainly I feel um, a very deep connection here. So what makes you uh, what makes you be young at heart these days? Just connecting to our topic. So you know when I told you that uh, in filmmaking, I just was thinking about this today. In filmmaking, um, you look for the essence of the story. I feel for me, um, what is happening to me as I'm, I'm growing older, I face a lot of difficulties, especially with the film business and in many aspects of my life, you know. So I think I'm discovering that what keeps me young is to try to remember to worry less and also be more playful. Um, um, trying to, you know, uh, I'm more in the process of looking at my, what is my essence, you know, and how can I keep that alive and go deeper with it. Um, being in nature is definitely being here by the ocean. I walk uh, when I'm here every day at the beach and it's just like such a source of, uh, of light for me and inspiration. Um, having connection with people that I love is really big for me. So I think that keeps me also young at heart. But uh, one thing that I learned in Puka Puka that was life-changing is that they work hard but also they play hard and they pray. So spirituality in whatever form or shape you want to um, connect to is a really big part of, uh, of my life. And I don't want to sound new agey, but I, I really mean it. Like having faith that things are going to work out even, even when they are completely outside of my control. That's that's where that's those are beautiful words. And uh, with your soul voice, it, <laughs> it keeps us calm. Um, so now your your next project or to finalize your project is the uh, the island in me can you tell us when we can see it so uh I, i'm gonna have news soon about a, a a wonderful premiere that we just locked but i can't announce it yet but um um you know we have um i have a talk well film page we you guys can also follow us on social media so I will be announcing it, you know, maybe in a couple of months or so. Um, and you know how the film works, right? You first uh, 
go to festivals and then hopefully we will be able to make it available through PBS because PBS has funded the film Pacific Islanders and Communications. Um, I don't have all the details nor I can reveal them right now, but it's, um, I'm really hopeful that the film will really reach um, you know, new audiences and people that have been waiting to watch the film for a long time um, you know, through festivals and also television um, broadcasts. But you know, uh, we have to wait a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> so one more thing, um, because I can see that all your or or all, all your movies are very much based on someone. Um, mm -hmm. what, what makes you click? What makes you say this is the person and this is the story? It has to be, you know, the beginning of my career. Um, I found the new, I found the stories on the news, maybe because I was trained as a journalist. Uh, right now, I'm finding it more in my life. Um, I, for me, it has to be something. It has to be a subject or a person that captiv captivates me. Um, this is because I don't know how long it's going to take me or what it's going to take. Because it really is a deep dive for me. I need to find somebody that is. I want to learn something from them or from her. Or uh, and in the end, I have to say, Maria, that when I finish my films and in the process of making the films. I realized that we are all like mirrors, like we're all reflecting each other. So I have to say that my films are all completely different, but I identify with, there are parts of me in all of them. Like, so it's almost like I'm making films about other people, but there's no separation, if that yeah. can make any sense. Oh, it definitely. Uh, they say that you are, um, you are the mix of the, your best, five friends or you're the, the five people that you spend more time with, you're just that that mix, right? For you, it's, it's even more because you have so many, so many friends. And um, um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I guess, uh, Gemma, I, I'll, I'll take a little bit of, of you and you can take a little bit of me. It's, it's, been, uh, it's always been a pleasure to spend some great moments with you and uh, I hope we can still do that and uh, please if you have any any other words and we will just say goodbye well you keep me young at heart so I, <laughs> I'm, I'm really pleased and I certainly we, are, we have met for many reasons so really thank you for giving me the opportunity to to share this with you and with everyone thank you very likewise much. <laughs> likewise Gemma thank you very much I will leave my uh, um, our audience with those words and um Stay young at heart, and we'll see you on our next episode. Thank you, Gemma. Bye-bye. Besitos. <laughs>